Hello everyone, my name is Yara Prashad Kuhn, and today we will be talking about practical tips and tricks for transport learning. As a quick bio, I recently graduated with my master's specializing in natural language processing from the NYU Center for Data Science, where I had the honor of being advised by Professor Sam Bowman. I am going to be joining Amazon Alexa in less than five days after this talk, um, where I will be focusing on natural language processing and more specifically fairness and bias in NLU models. Outside of machine learning, I'm also very interested and invested in healthcare and the intersection of technology and healthcare. Cool. So in terms of this talk, this talk will be a mix of formal and informal, mix of code snippets, um, more qualitative personal lessons, as well as a little bit of math. In terms of who this talk is geared for, um, it's really geared for people in industry or academia who are just getting started in transfer learning and are wondering and curious as to see what um, is necessary to set up as successful and stable experiments in transfer learning as possible. So let's get started. First, let's just go over what exactly transfer learning is. And to do that, let's go back to the, you know, uh, basic supervised learning regime, which consists of a model with weights data and a data set with examples xi and labels yi in the supervised um, regime. We want to find the data that minimizes the loss function of that task that the data set belongs to. Now, in order to introduce transfer learning, we need to start and set up some vocabulary. The task that we are talked about and is, that we mentioned before in supervised learning is the task that we're interested in optimizing for. Um, so this is the task that you, you eventually want to increase performance on. Transfer learning is based on the concept that um, having the model learn from similar tasks could help in the downstream performance of that target task. So especially, this is especially the case if the target task is very small and noisy and adding more data for the model to train on could actually improve performance. These tasks that the model um, can use to transfer on are called in for the sake of this, um, in the scope of this presentation, are going to be called transfer tasks. Of course, in literature, these tasks come by many names, including auxiliary tasks and intermediate tasks. These tasks are basically tasks that help a model learn knowledge that will boost performance on target tasks. So, what are some regimes in transfer learning? There's a lot of different ways to transfer this knowledge but we're going to be focusing on two types of transfer learning. The first is sequential learning, where you have given two tasks, where one is the target task and the other is the transfer task. You first train one, the first one, the transfer task, to convergence before training the model again on the second task, which is the target task to convergence. So here, the transfer task is denoted by x1, y1, and the target task is denoted by x2, y2. In sequential learning, we, we save the model weights data that was trained on the first task and use that model weight to instantiate for the second phase of training on the target task. For multitask learning regime, this is slightly different because we don't wait for one the model to converge on one task before moving on to the other. Here, we, we basically train um, all tasks together. So in this case, we're in, in this formula here, we see uh, two tasks, but of course you can add as many tasks as you would like for multitask learning and also for sequential learning as well. Um, but basically multitask learning can be thought of as modifying the loss function 
to become a linear combination of the two loss functions or objectives of the two target tasks, of, of the two tasks. So here we want to minimize theta over um, a combination of the losses of both of the tasks. Let's look at an example to really make this a bit more concrete. Suppose you're a tutoring company that is creating a chatbot that will help students study for the SATs. One of the sections is reading comprehension, which consists of given a text and a question, um, answering that question about the text. A lot of times in a lot of these um, sections, you can also find scientific text. And so this task would be English scientific QA task that the model will have to really be able to do to tutor a student well. One of the subtasks that this model might have to learn in order to do well is co-reference resolution, which is a task where given a text, the model must determine which nouns and which um, entities in the text are linked to each other and are referred to the same thing. And this, you can see, might be important because we need to be able to track entities within the text in order to understand what's going on and to answer questions about the text. In this case, the English scientific query task is the target task and coreference resolution is the transfer task. Now, transfer learning has been used um, in a variety of different ways. Uh, the poster child, perhaps, of which is BERT and its variants, which has pushed the state of the art in across a lot of different NLP tasks using transfer learning. In the medical domain, there's also been um, some work surrounding transfer learning in terms of boosting performance of several subsets of tasks at the same time, which, uh, for example, assertion, detection, and anti-extraction, and in public health, identifying and diagnosing various types of conditions online in social media has also been an interest and an application area of transfer learning. There's, of course, a lot more um, applications and work that has been done in applying transfer learning to various domains, but these are just the ones that um, come at the top of my mind and also that um, that are in the areas of interest that I'm personally interested in. Cool. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is that a lot of the time, fine tuning BERT will get you most of the way there. In terms of um, already, BERT is actually pre-trained on several objectives and thus just fine tuning BERT on your task is already in a sense, transfer learning. A lot of times you'll find that fine-tuning BERT will already do pretty well for your model and for your task. Um, however, that's not always the case. So today we'll be setting up first, setting up a transfer learning experiment. And for this uh, particular experiment that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at a style of training called stilts. Stilts was introduced by Peng in 2018 and consists of taking a already pre-trained model, so in this case um, BERT or BERT variants, and further doing transfer learning on it to improve performance on a, model, on a task. So we first need to, of course, pick the transfer task to transfer on um, to transfer from and boost performance on the target task on. And this transfer task in the paper is called an intermediate task. And we also want to pick a model. And given these, um, given these ingredients, we want to first fine tune on the intermediate task before fine tuning on the target task and evaluating on that target task. So in this case, you can see that this is transfer learning on top of transfer learning since BERT already is a product of transfer learning and we do further transfer learning on it. So um, 
With that said, before we get into the code of how to set up a transfer learning experiment, I just wanted to show a, you know, a simple um, visualization of what we're actually working with in terms of what the model actually looks like. So you can think about um, BERT and BERT variants as, um, in a sense, an encoder where it inputs, where you feed in the indices of the of the tokens, and you know those get gets fed into the model and passes through twelve or twenty four, however many layers of self attention and feed forward networks, um, and gets outputted, and that BERT output is then fed into a task specific head, where a lot of the times the task specific head is pretty simple and consists of an MLP um, that maps from the BERT embedding space to the output space. So for binary classification, the output space would be, for example, um, would be an output space of two. So with that said, let's get into the code. For the code um, snippet that I'll be showing in terms of how to set up a transfer experiment, I'll be using Giant, which is a open source toolkit that is maintained by NYU Silver Lab and which supports transfer learning experiments for both two-phase sequential style training as well as multitask training. Now, in terms of the code, um, this code might be a little bit more complicated than necessary because it is um, built to be relatively robust in terms of handling various errors in training and being able to resume training as well as being able to handle various types of transfer learning regimes. So here we see the tasks and which is divided into pre-training and target tasks. Pre-training tasks are basically transfer tasks that we talked about in this talk. We then in this um, code build the model and go into the two stages in this case of training, where we first train on the transfer task. So here we build the trainer and then we train on the transfer task before building the trainer yet again and training on the target task. Finally, we then evaluate on the target task. So here we don't do any evaluation on the pre-training task. The trainer, looking inside the trainer, the training loop looks like, um, you know, your average PyTorch um, training loop where we have, we, you know, sample from the data set and then for each batch, we pass it through the model, get the model outputs, do backprop uh, and add to the metrics. So this, you know, this is pretty standard. So now let's take a look and go back to the multitask training regime. As we view, this regime is given models, data, and tasks T1 and T2, um, and sampling rates beta 1 and beta 2. We want to train simultaneously on all the tasks, which um, in terms of looking at the objective function consists of adding a linear combination of the losses of both of the tasks to become the loss function of um, the objective that we want to ultimately train data on in the multitask training regime. So in practice, what we actually do is to sample from these tasks using their weights and to train for each batch, train on that sample task. So we're going to look at the code. And fortunately, this code and this toolkit that um, I'm using right now does allow for both multitask training and non-multitask training regimes. So we can just simply take a look at the training loop and the, um, and the code here to see how this might be implemented. So here we see the sampling weights which are calculated here. Um, we then figure out and sample from these tasks given the sample weights and at each 
time step, we take the sample task for that time step and train the model for one time step on that sample task. So um, pretty straightforward in terms of implementation. In terms of the sampling weights, um, usually what people do is to take the inverse of the data set size. Although, of course, um, this is also a field of research, so you can definitely um, try upsampling or downsampling your, one of your data set tasks, especially if um, the, your transfer task is a lot bigger than your target task, since you want to make sure that um, your multitask training isn't always sampling from the bigger task. Now that we've learned a bit about two of the transfer learning regimes, the next natural question is how to pick the task to transfer from, and why does transfer learning work? These two questions are intertwined and are both open research questions. It is still pretty wishy-washy and not very rigorous in terms of how to how to pick tasks to transfer from. Um, and a lot of people think about picking tasks as picking the transfer tasks to be tasks that are similar to your target task of choice. There's a few different ways to do this. The first is genre. Some people think about genre in terms of um, looking at the source of the data sets. So for example, if you're looking at um, question answering in English for SAT exams, for example, the source would be SAT exams. And you might look for transfer tasks that are also annotated from SAT exams, even if they're not QA tasks. This is because um, it's basically trying to teach the model more about the domain. So in this case, SAT type questions or scientific text. Um, and by having the model learn more about the domain, helping the model excel in your target task of choice. The second way is looking at the type of task. So in this case, it would be question answering. You might look into transfer tasks that are also question answering, but not in scientific text or SAT exams. So for example, QA in fiction books. Um, and the thought behind that is that those tasks would help the model understand the actual task at hand of how to answer questions. The third, which also feeds into genre as well, is vocabulary overlap, which is a method of determining how similar two task sources are in terms of um, the amount of vocabulary overlap between two data sets. Another way that people have looked into in terms of choosing transfer tasks is to create task embeddings for each of these tasks. So these task embeddings are such that if two tasks are shown to transfer well, then their task embeddings would be similar, where similarity is measured by cosine similarity. There's a lot of ways to create these embeddings even using features that include the ways of um, choosing tasks that we talked about before in terms of genre, task type, and vocabulary overlap. There's also more subtle features that you could use, which a lot of researchers are currently looking at. For example, given a task and a model trained on a task to compute the expected covariance of the gradients of the log likelihood with respect to the model weights. So that's just an example of how to compute and create task embeddings um, that people have looked into. And that's and the one I just mentioned was um, work from Vu et al. 2020. Now, time for tips. First, be prepared to run a lot of transfer experiments before finding one that works. Transfer learning is not guaranteed to work. And a lot of times you will set up an experiment and think that you know a task will transfer well to your target task and set up the experimentation just to find that it doesn't help at all. And that is <laughs> the harsh reality. So tip number one is to create a research code base that enables you and allows you to 
to run a lot of different transfer tasks to find one that works for your target task. And what does this actually entail? Going back to what I, um, something I had talked about before is first is to make sure that your code is as modular as possible in terms of plugging in different tasks to try transfer learning with, as well as plugging in different models to try transfer learning. Secondly is, and this is honestly not only for transfer learning, but in, but it's good for any machine learning experiments in general, is to make sure that you have a setup that would easily allow you to correctly resume training. If your job gets killed and your experiment gets killed, you will need to have um, the processes in place to save the op optimizer, model states, and metric states in order to correctly resume training. Third is to always log. Not only is logging good for seeing where your job is and where your experiments are in terms of um, the training process, but also to be able to compare different experiments to see what works and what doesn't. Config driven flows are great for this because configs are a great way to succinctly summarize what a experiment is in a file. And lastly, automate when you can. And I think this is this speaks for itself. So I'm going to again go back to Giant here to show you my workflow. So I use Giant, which um, is an open source framework and is tailored specifically for this type of plug and play experimentation in terms of plugging in different hugging face models as well as plugging in and experimenting with different types of NLP tasks of which more than 30 are supported in Giant. It also has infrastructure for resuming training and logging and checkpointing. So it does um, all of that for you and automates experiments um, to some degree in terms of helping with um, deployment to GCP and to, to Slurm as well. And if you're interested in Giant, definitely check out giant.info um, and it supports both se sequential two-phase training as well as multitask training. Now, in terms of automation, it is really important, especially if you're going to be running a lot of experiments, to make sure that um, you have all of the experiment and command runs in one place. You can imagine how it might be hard to, if you run you know, a command like this a hundred times to lose track about which um, experiments you have running versus which ones you haven't run yet. And you would often want to just, you know, run a bash script like this. So I'm going to show you what um, a group of collaborators and I used for a recent paper where we had to run over a thousand um, experiments over with over 30 tasks. And that necessitated a lot of automation and parallelization of experiments. So here's what we used to automate. Uh, let's see. This is the bash, um, bash file that we used. And we basically dynamically create a command and execute it. So we use the something called Slurm, which is a job management system that is um, available in NYU and a lot of educational institutions as well. And so that's basically what this line is. And this basically builds the command and then executes and runs this, this S batch, um, which basically puts these puts this command into a queue to, to run a job on. We then have a bunch of, you know, helper code and helper um, functions to help us build this um, command. And we try to make it as easy as possible so that instead of running something very hairy, like the command we had seen before in terms of this command right here, 
you would instead have everything in one file and you know encapsulate it into one file in um, relatively simple syntax so you can see exactly what you're running and have everything all in one place. So it's not only good for automation and, and having and trying to re retain sanity in, in running experiments, but it's also very good for keeping track of um, the state of your experiments and what is being run. Cool. Tip number two. If you can, um, try to use a P40 or B100. And this has this was a, um, a lesson that I learned after trying a lot of the different GPUs and seeing the CUDA out of memory error with each one before asking a lab mate and then finding out that you should use a P40. <laughs> so use a P40. Tip number three is um, pretty, perhaps even basic in terms of, you know, a lot of intro to deep learning type classes have this is that learning rates really matters. Um, and a lot of times when you're debugging models, it might be kind of daunting because there's so much that could go wrong in terms of, you know, your model might be incorrect, your data might be incorrect, or, you know, something could be incorrect. There's a lot of different variables that could go wrong. And one of the first ways that I would look at is to try to alter the learning rate, um, especially if you're looking into the multitask training regime, because different tasks might have different learning rates that they converge at. For example, mass, um, language modeling tends to have um, and need a higher learning rate than other tasks. So definitely take into account um, how you're dealing with learning rates in transfer learning. The second part here is that seeds also matter and transfer learning experiments um, are also affected by different seeds. Now, you may have heard that seeds, um, that setting a seed is best practice for maintaining reproducibility. Um, however, it has also been my experience that having different seeds and with the same model and the same setup and the same tasks, but three different seeds, you might find three different performances and three different amounts of success from transfer learning. So also varying your seeds might also help you find what um, seed will help with a better convergence of the model. And you can set a seed by doing this. Number four, you might find that um, when you're doing transfer learning experiments that you're actually getting negative transfer. So that means basically that you're after doing the transfer learning experiments and you know going through all that hassle that the end result for your target task is actually lower than, than if you had just fine tuned the model directly on the target task. This is called negative transfer, and a lot of times um, it has been, a lot of times this might be due to catastrophic forgetting, where the model might forget what it had learned in a previous step, um, if especially in a model um, like BERT, which is already, you know, pre-trained on other, on other types of tasks. Um, so definitely look into catastrophic forgetting. And this is also an open field of research where um, people are trying to figure out how to mitigate um, negative transfer while also still pushing positive transfer. This next tip is for people who are training on tasks that are not in English. If you are in such a case, you actually might want to consider training on transfer tasks that are in, in English. This is because recent work, including some work that um, I helped do in collaboration with people at NYU um, has shown that even transferring from English tasks can actually help with downstream performance in target tasks. So definitely consider that. And I will link the paper um, on the last slide as well. 
next, if you can, just use a more powerful model. Um, so if you're using Bert, try using Roberta. And if you're using Roberta, try using Albert. I've, I've seen in my experience um, that transfer learning and the gains that can be made from transfer learning also decreases with the power and the amount of expressiveness of the model. So, so if you train on Albert um, and try doing training on Albert with intermediate task training and with transfer learning, you might find that the gains from transfer learning with Albert are smaller than the gains you see with Bert, for example. Um, so if you can and you have, you know, the compute and the memory to do so, try to just use a more powerful model and just do direct fine tuning of that model instead of using a smaller model and doing multi-phase or multi-task type training. Lastly, um, try training for longer and also use traditional Atom. So these two tips are from recent work that has shown that BERT a lot of times is undertrained. And so definitely train for more than three epochs, which is the amount of training that um, Devlin et al. used in the, um, in the original work. And to also use Adam and not BERT Adam if you're using BERT variants, um, since BERT Adam, which is the training regime that was used in the original BERT paper, actually does not um, do bias correction in the update. And so these two, these two, two tips have been shown to stabilize training as well as help improve performance overall. And you can also check out the paper um, from Zeng et al. that show this. Phew, that was a lot of different tasks. Um, here are all the tasks that we covered and I'll also, this will also be up for you after this talk. The last thing I wanted to point out is that research reproducibility is hard. If you find a paper that is relevant for you and you try to implement it and aren't able to achieve the scores, don't beat yourself up too much about it. Um, a lot of times these papers will not have their code released and will not have confidence intervals or statistical tests um, to, sh to show the stability of the results. Um, and so you know, don't be afraid to reach out to the authors and ask them, given their hyperparameter sweep, which parameters and hyperparameters actually worked and helped um, in terms of achieving the scores they had. Now that we've looked into setting up experiments and learning a few tips and tricks to helping uh, achieve success in transfer learning, I thought to touch on a bit of the cutting edge research surrounding what other things you could use and that people are currently doing to help maximize success. The first of this is using self-supervised pre-training to help adapt your model to your domain. For example, uh, if you're working on clinical text, you might want to adapt BERT to, um, to your clinical text by pre-training BERT further on that clinical corpus or some other clinical corpus. And in fact, this is work that has been done in the past in the clinical domain. Um, Self-supervision is something we have not yet touched on and could be a presentation all on its own, but it's basically um, a, a family of machine learning methods where you artificially generate um, supervised labels from unsupervised and unlabeled data. The most famous, well, arguably the most famous uh, task that has come from self-supervision in NLP is mass language modeling, where given a large corpus, you mask out various tokens in that corpus and tell the model and ask the model, given the context of that corpus, can the model learn to predict what those mass words are. So in this case, we artificially create labels since we mask, we know the tokens that are masked, 
and also artificially create examples to train the model on. So that's um, one example of self-supervision. And the paper that is linked here um, has shown that further pre-training on MLM has been shown to help in terms of domain transfer. The second um, method and thing you might do and people are experimenting with is to add regularization to your training regime. Um, the thought behind this is that you, if there is catastrophic forgetting happening and you are seeing negative transfer, you probably want to limit the amount that your weights are deviating from the initial set of weights. Um, and the thought behind that is that the model might be unlearning or forgetting some of the knowledge that it had learned from previous phases of transfer learning and training. Um, and so you want to regulate the amount that the parameters are changed from one update step to the next. The third type of method that we're going to be talking about is relevant to multitask learning, where we have um, various tasks that we learn together and we want to weight the various loss functions for each of these tasks in order to learn. To do this, researchers have realized that there is no one size fits all set of weights for all combinations of tasks. The question becomes, how do you find the ideal and optimal weights that will allow your model to extract the information from all tasks and maximize performance on your target task. Some um, approaches and the naive approach would be to try a bunch of different sets of weight combinations and just run a lot of experiments. That might work, but um, there is research currently being done on how to optimize and learn weights on the go without having to do all of those tedious and computationally expensive and time intensive experiments. So that's um, kind of touching on meta learning and contextual methods, which are current fields of research right now. Cool. Now that we've covered you know, so much, um, I wanted to wrap up this talk by giving you some resources especially for people who are looking to find tasks that might help um, in their transfer learning experiments. First, here are some data sets that are definitely not comprehensive, but could help you start um, in your journey of looking for various NLP tasks. It might be a bit daunting to try to find that perfect task for whatever use case you have, but one, um, one way you could start to do that is to take a look at any of these tasks and the papers of any of these tasks and data sets and look at the related work section. You'll find a lot of different other data sets from there and by tracing down that goose hunt, um, you might be able to find a data set that is a good fit for what you're doing. Now, some other ways to find data sets and other sources for data sets are to also look at benchmarks, such as uh, Clue, Superclue, Clue, <laughs> and Extreme, as well as other, other benchmarks out there. These hold a variety of various um, data sets and could also be starting good starting, starting places for you to look at. Secondly, you might want to look at large survey papers, such as um, ones by Vu and Huang, and as well as um, a project that I worked on in the past as well. These are papers that uh, do run a bunch of experiments on a bunch of different tasks. And so these also might be a good bank of various tasks to look at. I'd also like to point out to one of my most recent work, uh, which is definitely in one of these, you know, large um, papers, large amount of task papers, where we look into when and why transfer learning works. 
Um, and we do a lot of different transfer learning experiments. So you can also check that out to see which tasks end up transferring well or not so well on others. Third would be to look at some academic labs. There's some academic labs such as um, Yejin Choi's group at UW that is notorious and well known for producing a lot of d different data sets. And so I would also take a look at the papers coming out of there and see if there is anything that is a fit for what you're doing. Here are, and here are some more papers for reference. I wanted to close this talk with a last thought, which is kind of the summary of my experience in transfer learning so far. Transfer learning is so powerful and has a lot of potential to, to help improve performance. The question is how to do so, and that in itself is still a lot of trial and error. There's so many various variables in transfer learning in terms of um, having tasks that are not matched with each other or having a model that is unable to extract the correct knowledge from the various tasks. So there's so much and so many questions still left in the field and there's so much more to do. With that said, thank you very much for listening and I welcome any questions.